welcome to redistricting testimony content, the data lens and the data lenses project. In the next hour, we're going to be going through different ideas about redistricting that hopefully will spark your own ideas for what you want to put into your content, into your testimony for the redistricting commission. The goals for this session are really to increase your understanding of redistricting. I'm assuming you have some understanding, but, uh, but not, it doesn't have to be in great detail. Uh, we're going to explore some different demographics of Washington State, and we're going to explore the implications of voting power on how you draw the lines. If you draw the lines differently, how does voting power change? And then think about and explore what kind of questions you might ask yourself to get to what, what you want to say about your district or your area and the districts in your area. So we would start with a poll. Everybody knows redistricting, woohoo. <laughs> that just helps me gauge the audience. At this point, you may be thinking these kinds of questions. What would I say? Why would my district ever change? Isn't it all just gerrymandered anyway is kind of the fatalistic side. Uh, should I be talking about my legislative district or my congressional district? Where's the data to support my ideas? Is there, is there any? Uh, so these things could be coming to mind and I'm hoping that through the data lenses project will give you some, some interesting things to go explore as well as some other ideas about what you might actually say. So let's get into the data lenses project itself. So Politics of the Possible with assistance from the League of Women Voters did a project over the last two years called the Data Lenses Project. And it was originally crafted because we are going to draw maps. And the idea that the current maps completely bias the next set of maps. <laughs> and there's a lot of partisan wrangling and there's a lot of, uh, you know, is it partisan, isn't partisan, what's a community of interest, all these kinds of things. So it was started with the idea of, if you didn't use the existing maps, where would you start? And so the idea was, well, let's look at the demographics of Washington State and see what that tells us about where we would draw the line. So we, we thought of five different types of demographics, we called them data lenses. So kind of this idea that you would look at something from one lens, and then you might look at something from another lens and see what that tells you. Uh, it's a tool for advocacy, it's a tool for education. When we completed the project, we created this website for people to use and actually go on and explore the maps. So you can get to the website using teeny URL, dot com slash data lenses and you're welcome to go on on there now if you want to figure it out and kind of follow along i will be going live to that website to give some demonstrations um, so we can actually explore and interact with the maps that we've put on there so our five lenses were, are listed here and they were basically created because those were the things that come up in conversation. I've talked to thousands of different people in redistricting education seminars and these are the things that came up. And so we wanted to actually take the data, all the data on the maps are from the 2017 Census Bureau data from the American Community Survey and, and then see how that would show us where to draw the lines. We created six maps. Here are the six maps. We had two with the race and ethnicity, one people of color all grouped together. Two is the Latinx or Hispanic as it's, as it's labeled in the census. Three was tribal. So these are the current reservations, not tribe, not where people who identify with the tribes live, but where the reservations are and low income, which was households, incomes under 40K, environment, and where people were employed, in what industry they were employed. So we looked at each one of those and said, ah, how would we draw the lines? 
Uh, so please note, this goes beyond your regular packing and cracking that you may have heard about in redistricting. It's much more subtle, right? When we talk about gerrymandering and we're trying to explain it and what's going on in Wisconsin or North Carolina, right? We think pure packing and cracking. And this is more subtle than that. It has the same kinds of ideas where you may be grouping people together um, for in that data lens, uh, but it's not as extreme as we think of when we think of gerrymandering. There's lots of more complexities. My grandmother who did the first ever redistricting of comprehensive redistricting of Washington State in 1965, she always used to say, it's like a fishbowl full of billiard balls. You move one set of lines for a district and all those other ones have to go ka-chunk, ka-chunk, ka-chunk and change it. Because of course we want each district to have equal population. And the reason is because of voting power, right? We want equal population because we want one person, one vote. So let's look at our voting power examples. And all of this is on the website, which we'll go to uh, in a minute. But if we had a theoretical state that had a thousand people in it, and we had pure split, we had a 70% majority group in a 30% minority group, we could potentially draw lines so that those groups were in certain amount of power in each district. So this shows us four different examples, right? If we have pure even spread, everybody minority majority is spread all over, then we'd have A, we'd be looking at A, but of course in the district, the majority would win every district. So they would be in complete control. And when I say majority and minority, it can be anything, right? It, we think of minority meaning ethnic groups, but that's not necessarily what I'm talking about, right? It could be people who like roses and people who like some other flower, daffodils, right? <laughs> like it, this could be any group where you have an identity, where you are connected to them in any, in any way. Um, so let's go on to the other ones. B would be an example where we completely segregate. And if it was possible, you'd put all the people in a minority group, they could just have their own district. They'd win the whole, they'd win the whole district. Uh, we, turns out we don't live that way, so it's not usually possible. C is proportional. We love proportionality. It just seems fair <laughs> to everyone. Um, and then D is kind of the other extreme, which is maximizing the power of the minority group. So you can see if we carefully crafted districts, so there could be 51 people in, from the minority group and it, we could get them to have five, which would, be a, which would be amazing to have five districts, right, that they were in control of when overall they're 30% of the population. Right? So these are the extreme examples so that when you're going on and you're looking at the maps, you can kind of look at how the power dynamics change in terms of the amount of voting power you might have in a district. Any questions at this point? I know this is a, a lot of numbers on the slide, but Kit's giving me a thumbs up. Okay. So let's go to the actual maps. The number one thing that you need to know about the data lens maps is that the existing districts as they were drawn by the commission in 2011 are on the left-hand side. And the new districts that we've drawn as an example, they're not necessarily a legal map, but as an example are on the right-hand side. And what you do is grab the big, bar, grayish bar in the middle, and you slide it one way or the other. So let's actually go to the website at this point. So here's our redistricting lens website, and you just scroll down to read all of the information and get to, um, and get to the maps. There's also a menu at the top that you can jump directly to the maps. 
I will point out that in my using map section, I have recorded a tutorial video. It's about 12 minutes long that people can listen to and I go through how do you actually manipulate the maps in detail. Uh, so let's go to our map. Here's our first people of color map and you can see the darker sections are those census tracts that have more or higher percentage people of color. In this case, up around 40% is the darkest, um, the darkest color. The existing maps on the left, new, interesting, trying to get people of color more voting power maps <laughs> on, the, on the right. And we just grab this in the middle and it slides one way or the, one way or the other. And we just look at, you can see, I don't think I zoomed in. You can see down here towards Yakima that um, where these, the Yakima Nation was split in half in our current districts, we in this new one said, oh, let's put them all together in, in one. You can also click on a given district and find out information about that district. So this is all the data in the back. So that's kind of interesting if you wanna see how the, any individual um, area is affected before and after the redistricting. The percentage Republican and Democratic are from county records from 2016. Uh, they are a little bit general, so we need to um, we need to take care when we're taking those as gospel. It's just a guideline, not an exact science. So let me give you an example. I thought I would just use my own district as an example since I know it. <laughs> so I'm in Legislative District 28 here in Tacoma and it's kind of an interesting district. It is known as a swing district and we are represented by uh, a Republican senator and currently two, Repub or two Democratic legislators. And it goes from down here near Fort Lewis, if you guys are familiar with the South Sound area, all the way up here towards the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. And I happen to live right here in the very tippy top of this district, which makes it a, an interesting district, right? Most of my life is spent over here. I go running in Point Defiance Park. I go to the grocery store over here, which is in the 27th district. Um, although I did own a business down here a little farther. Um, so it's a question for me of where is my community? Really, my life is much more centered in downtown, downtown Tacoma, uh, where I teach martial, martial arts is actually in Seattle, but I do teach down here in downtown Tacoma and, and whatnot. So when, you're th when I'm thinking about my district, I'm thinking, hmm, maybe if I really wanted to be with the people that I'm around more, I would want a district that was more the tip of, um, tip of Tacoma and, and whatnot. On the other hand, it is really interesting to be in a much more diverse district. We have the largest mental health hospital in Washington in our district down, down here in Lakewood. We've got all of the military families. The range, the, the range of incomes is much higher in the 28th than the 27th. Uh, and yeah, it's just, it's super interesting to get people who are living along the lakeshore, people who are here closer to the freeway and all of those kinds of things. And I personally like a swing district because it's persuadable and you never know what's gonna happen, right? So I think I would maybe vote for not going quite so far east um, and maybe grabbing a few more of my compatriots in, um, in kind of suburbia Tacoma into the 28th. Uh, again, but again, you see, I'm already biased on where it is now, right? <laughs> um, but here's how it, how it looks. So if we take our 
our bar now and we say, oh, well, so how did we change this up um, when we were doing new ones? Look at this, this district that I'm in now. Remember, I'm right here by the bridge. Now it kind of goes, I'll tip down here, kind of goes around the corner. And it's a very different district <laughs> because of the way all those billiard balls stacked up when we were trying to group folks by, um, by communities of color. Okay, so questions uh, on that as just my, my own district example. Allison, is it possible to comment on the impact on voting power from this proposed map? Yes. So when we did look at voting power, let me go back to the, we did look at voting power for people of color. We use these histograms of, um, of where, where, uh, how, what percentage was it, how many districts had what percentage of the, of the vote, right? So if we look on the left-hand side, that was the original districts when we tried to somewhat unscientifically just group people of color in great, trying to think, oh, we'll give them greater voting power, right? You're thinking packing, I know. <laughs> uh, but that is how you, we created majority minority districts to give them more voting power. That was part of the Voting Rights Act. Um, turned out, that we kind of slid things a little bit. We were somewhat successful where we had these like 12 districts that were around 30 to 40% people of color. We got, we got them moved up higher into more like 40 or 50%. And, and at the same time, we took some districts that were not necessarily the same district, but we had one, two districts that were in that 56 to 62 and we created one that was set almost 75%. Well, at 75%, now did we just pack, pack them unnecessarily, right? So it's a really interesting um, and challenging and complex problem to say, while we were trying to group people of color to give them more voting power, we actually may have packed them too much and decreased the total number. So, tricky, tricky, tricky to try to look at the bigger picture overall when you're working at the individual district level. And that's part of the challenge, right? We're each going to say what we would like to see in our communities, and then we'll have to take a step back, and the commission definitely does, to look at the larger picture and balance, um, balance all of the different kinds of lenses that we're looking at, in this case, people of color. Other questions? Let me go back here. So under each one of the lenses, we've created a list of critical questions because it really is about you, the person who's saying, what do I want? It is about the communities themselves. Um, so understanding that Maybe I'd rather have three districts where, uh, where my group, say uh, ethnic group, Latinx, right? Uh, maybe my group would be better off having three or four districts that are at 30% rather than one district that's at 60% of the vote. What does that community want? The Yakima Nation has clearly said, their, their representatives have clearly said, we want uh, the whole reservation to be in one legislative district. Loud and clear, we've heard them loud and clear, but that may not be the case for all communities. Does your community even vote all the same way? Does that, you know, the, co the complexities and the diversity in your own community may not, may not make sense for the issues you care most about. There may be a divide. Um, among your own ethnic community, among your own geographic community. And I think the intersectionality of all of our different identities, whether it's our ethnicity, our, our faith, our, what we do for a job, our recreational habits, all of the things that make us up is really interesting how those, how those intersect. And 
can we influence by testifying? We're trying to influence those commissioners. So we really want to have our re rationale down so that we can influence the commissioners. Let's take a look at one more thing redistricting wise. And I really do hope you explore the maps. I found out, in fact, let's do one, I think we've got time. Let's do one more, which I've, I'm telling you when I was preparing for this one, I discovered this. I did not know enough about the Colville Reservation and, um, and OMAC. So I was looking at the Colville Reservation and I was, looking at district um, seven here, right? And I was like, what's going on? Do you guys see that? You see the lines here around OMAC? They must have needed lots more population in district seven. I'm gonna zoom in a little more. Here's the town of OMAC, right? Look at this district line. <laughs> so this is district seven. And then these folks over here are in district 12. Uh, so it's kind of by this vision, you got seven in the top and 12 in the bottom. And so you can have neighbors on either side of you that are in a different district, right? Now there's about 2000 people that live in OMAC. I had to look that up. Uh, and so I wonder what they want. This is a little screwy right here. There's another town, Mallet, uh, Okanagan and Mallet down here that are another thousand people, another 500 people, right? But it was because you needed the equal population in District 7, so they had to pick up maybe half the people of OMAC in, in, uh, into the districts. Now this also is showing how we've split the Colville Reservation, which is this green. Let me zoom out a little bit. So the green, we've split it between the two legislative districts, and it's also split between the two congressional districts, which is not shown. So that kind of just exploration, I had to look up, you guys know about the balancing rock? There's a, there's a balance rock, it's really famous, like world famous, I didn't even know. Uh, outside of OMAC in the, in the Colville Indian Reservation is this a beautiful, huge balancing boulder. It's like the size of your house, it looks like. <laughs> uh, so anyway, that's why, I, wish you to explore that because those kinds of things are so interesting to find out about our state and about your area, those kinds of things. Okay, I thought I would go through the criteria that the commissioners are going to use. They have to use this as part of our law when they're drawing the lines. And the Data Lens Project is primarily interested in the two that I've highlighted in red here. The preserve your communities of interest and, in, and encourage electoral competition. And that's that data lens, those are communities of interest, right? And voting power, electoral competition. Um, but just as a, you're gonna unmute and say, just as a poll, quick poll, what do you think is most important? You guys can just yell it out. Equal population I still see as important. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Electoral competition. Yeah, you'd put yeah, that. I agree, but I think that's, that's my personal favorite. But. That you want everything to be more competitive. Yeah. 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 So what's choice. interesting, uh, what was that? I said I want more discussion and choice. I want us to wrestle with these things. Yeah. Yeah. I also like the fair and effective representation. Yeah. And yet those words are so hard to define. What does that mean, right? I want an effective representation. Yeah. So the interesting thing in our law, we don't rank any of these. So what it allows the commissioners to do is say, well, we put the line there because of a community of interest. Well, we put the line there because we didn't want to split the city. Oh, we put it there because we were trying to do a more competitive, right? And in, and it's and it's it allows them in some ways to draw the lines where they want and use these criteria to justify it. And while I don't know that that's what they're doing, it seems a little suspect. Uh, so I think the overall conclusion from the data lenses project are these two, that there are dramatic new possibilities when we look at 
the demographics of our state in a new way. The two I'm showing here are environmental, right? Would we draw our congressional districts differently if we were looking at it from an environmental lens? Absolutely, we'd keep the Pacific Coast together, right? There's so many things that those folks in, um, you know, uh, what's across the, a story is the Oregon one <laughs> down here at the southeastern of our state and way, I mean, southwestern of the state, way up in the other peninsula tip, uh, you know, that they have in common, absolutely. And the other thing that it was shown by us trying to manipulate and looking at the percentages of, um, and therefore the voting power of different groups in with these different lenses is it has a huge effect on the voting power. And those effects are not always obvious from how you draw the lines. Allison, can I ask a question? Yeah. So as, and of course, this is just saying the only lens you used in this map was environmental. Sure. So, yeah. so you likely have vastly different populations. Yeah, I mean, we all know. No, yeah, you weren't looking at any of that. Yeah. Right. The idea the idea from the data lens project was to let's simplify it a little bit. This is so complex. Let's simplify it a little bit. If we were to just look at environmental, how would we draw the lens? We would draw them very differently, right? Because if we were just concerned, now clearly people down in Vancouver have very different things going on than people up in the Olympic Peninsula in Fort Angeles, right? <laughs> uh, but they all have river water things going on, right? So it's just meant to expand your mind about the possibilities and force you to think more about uh, how, what things are important to you and how you want to be grouped in that sense. Uh, the implications of that I think are obvious, right? The electoral competitiveness is not just about D's versus R's. That's gonna be the main driver but there's so much more that could be competitive when we're talking about ethnic, when we're talking about businesses, right? Boeing just moving uh, its 787 out of our states. Huge implications for aerospace in Washington. Um, voting power, we talked about that. How you draw the lines is going to change. Understanding that dynamic of do you want lots of districts where you have maybe a little bit less influence, but you've got more districts you you and your group whatever that minority group is can influence or do you want more districts where you can be assured of voting in the person that your group wants to vote in but they may battle it when they get to the chamber and they are the only one representing your group uh, and then of course it's all about balance and compromise when you have to draw the complete set of maps Right? We have to take all the inter intersectionalities into account and we can't just let the computers do it. It's about human interpretation. So that's why it's so important for each of you to say what you want so that the commissioners know what people really want and they get a bigger feel from a lot more of us about how the lines should be drawn. So if we go back to you and you are trying to write your testimony, I thought of these kinds of questions for you. Think about where is your community? Where's, where's your kids' schools? Where do you work? Where are your places of worship? Where do you shop? Where do you recreate? What is your community? Think about why you live where you live. Are there reasons that you chose to live there and are those ones that you want to highlight as being important to the commissioners? What parts of your identity are most important to you and therefore are part of your community of interest? What issues matter most to you? If I live on the coast, maybe it's things about the ocean environment. If I live on a river, maybe it's I live in Everett and I just now know Boeing's business is going to change in Everett, right? Those kinds of things. And the most importantly, how do you and your vote, how do you want to have the most influence? 
and where the lines are drawn can affect you personally and how your vote has that influence. Questions, comments, or additions here? Pat's giving me a thumbs up. <laughs> and I think these are not easy questions to answer, but I think if you do find them, your presentation, your testimony is going to be so powerful because it will come from a true, honest, high integrity place about what you want. So next steps, of course, is to create those <laughs> testimonies and actually testify. So here's the timeline. We're going to do, we're doing all these speak up schools in February through April. And then uh, the commission is most likely going to have their first round of open uh, public testimony in May or June. We will be up we at the league will be updating folks so they'll know when that's coming up as soon as we hear from the commission about what their timing is. So keep tuned. And then secondly, we're gonna draw some maps. So we have partnered with Dave's redistricting app shown here. And I highly encourage you to get an account, it's free, and play around with it. You can see here I've started to create a map even if it's just you creating your own little district in your own area, that's really interesting. And it's potentially you could take a screenshot or you could download the map from the from Dave's redistricting app and that could be part of your testimony. Here's where I think my community is and how I want my districts to be drawn. And you can admit you haven't done a full state map, but at least it's very detailed about where you want your district to be drawn. And if there's an option to get trained on the Dave's redistricting app, I highly encourage you to, uh, to go get some training and figure out all the cool things about this app. It is meant for the general public and it's free. Uh, and thanks to the guys at Dave, Dave's redistricting app for partnering with us. And as I always conclude all of my presentations, our government only works if we participate and I am so excited that so many of you are going to be testifying in front of the redistricting commission. I will take any questions.